Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, so, for this last session, um, we have a couple of uh, very good colleagues of mine uh, who are the co-directors of the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, of Michael Levine, and Carnegie Mellon, and, and Ralph Roskies uh, from the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and, of course, uh, as the directors of one of the country's uh, major supercomputing centers, uh, they are, as you might imagine, thinking very hard uh, about e-science and about the emergence of uh, data-intensive computing and its importance in scientific discovery. And so uh, Ralph Roskies uh, will give uh, some of their thoughts uh, about this. Ralph? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so as those of you who don't know, uh, Michael and I have been co-directors of the center for since it started 23 years ago, and we seem to be interchangeable in many venues, and so we've appeared on committees as Mike Roskies or Ralph Levine or something like that. So I've been chosen today to actually deliver the talk, but it's on behalf of both of us. Uh, and it's about the role of data in NSF, uh, in, in NSF thinking about cyber infrastructure. I'll start with a brief uh, review of the history of the NSF supercomputing program, which began in 1985. And it is the method by which uh, primary access to large-scale computational power is provided to the national uh, academic research community. I mean, there are other people that provide uh, high performance computing cycles, notably DOE and so on, but those are mostly uh, uh, mission specific uh, efforts, although lately the DOE has expanded its uh, access to a, a, a broader set. Uh, strangely enough, NIH has uh, declined to provide supercomputing resources, although they supply, uh, provide a lot of support for people work and so on. Uh, if you want, I can talk about that some later in the question period if you want. And supercomputing, I'll interpret here to be broadly uh, construed to include networking and storage and visualization and application development and so on. And I, I must say, there have been huge developments in, in the time that we've been in business, a factor of 10 to the sixth in the strength of computing power measured in flops and scientific payoff in virtually every field. And uh, I created this slide a few years ago. We've had 11 supercomputers here in the history of the supercomputing center. I showed the first 10 of them here. And uh, in each case, I can point to applications that uh, were enabled by uh, the increase in computing power. Now, as I keep telling people, Turing showed that you could do everything on any computer you wanted. But to make it feasible in terms of either the time to solution or the uh, the memory that you need in order to get the necessary resolution and things like that. Um, it's quite remarkable. And it's in all sorts of fields, atmospheric science, materials, heart modeling, uh, um, molecular biology, astrophysics, and so on. Um, organizationally, it's interesting just for a moment to talk about that. Uh, the high performance of the supercomputing program began in the office of the director at NSF. And sh soon thereafter, uh, it got put into the division as a division at NSF instead of an office, and in the directorate that had to do with computing. Um, and that was an uneasy marriage for the time that it went on, uh, because uh, fundamentally, what computer science was interested in, certainly in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, uh, uh, the, uh, the development of internet and so on uh, was not really what the uh, supercomputing centers were doing, and the customers were outside of the computer science community. Um, so recently, they moved it back as an office now of cyber infrastructure, uh, which again reports directly to the director of NSF, and they see high performance computing more broadly as piece of an essential infrastructure for the country and if you listen to Ed Seidel, who until very recently was the director of the Office of Cyber Infrastructure, uh, he talks very much about 
the centrality of data as one of the main drivers for cyber infrastructure. And ironically, uh, this move from out of the uh, directorate that deals with computer science back to the office uh, uh, reporting directly to the director happened just at a time where this increase in, in emphasis on data is becoming much more relevant to what it is that computer scientists are worried about. But that's uh, just uh, irony. Um, now, the drivers, you've heard a lot of that from this conference. Uh, why are we paying, why is NSF paying uh, a lot of attention to data? And its importance in scientific discovery, there have been a lot of things presented at this meeting <coughs> on genomics. <coughs> I'll show you some uh, just uh, rough measures of data flows, for example, that are supposed to emerge from the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, from huge astronomy databases, from large-scale simulations, and we're expecting it in an increasing number of fields. So here's a slide I got from Paul Avery. This is just one of the experiments at CERN. Um, there's data being generated uh, from the online, from the, from the physics of the detection system, going to the CERN Computer Center, where it then gets massaged and, of course, greatly uh, increased. And we're talking about sustained data rates uh, where people are, where they're sending out the uh, results for further analysis uh, around the world at uh, tens of gigabits per second sustained. Uh, the, another example is uh, astronomy, and this is a uh, picture of uh, a representation of a telescope which is going to be uh, finished and put into operation in 2013. Uh, the data rates are pretty daunting. They're going to do 20 terabytes of imaging every night. They have to monitor a lot of variations in real time. Um, They'll be producing petabyte catalogs in database systems uh, every year. And they figure they will have accumulated something like 60 petabytes of data in databases at the end of the project, which is someplace between 10 and 15 years. So very large amounts of data. And I'll come back to that. We heard in this meeting uh, of interesting work by the people at Harvard uh, on transmission electron microscope data, uh, just as an example, um, they have been transferring data to the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center for further analysis, and they take a bunch of sections of brain, and, and then they want to register this and construct a volume, and the, I, the goal is eventually to see individual neurons through the brain volume. Um, They've been transferring it that, to, that data to Pittsburgh for de-warping primarily. And uh, they've moved 110 terabytes of data to us to do this kind of analysis over network. So it's very large amounts of data. Uh, not a huge amount of computing, actually, once you get the data. Uh, but it, it's interesting. Uh, another example now coming from, those were things generated by instruments. Uh, now, if I talk about things generated by simulations, look at seismology, for example. There are two uh, major groups doing uh, uh, seismology simulations. One's here at Carnegie Mellon called Quake, and there is a group at the Southern California Earthquake Center that has a similar but different code called AWM, and they're producing outputs that are uh, presumably based on the same inputs, but uh, with slightly different algorithms involved. And they want to compare the results to see whether or not uh, they're consistent with each other. So if you were to do a voxel by voxel comparison, I mean, it just wouldn't work. Um, so you need uh, data-intensive statistical analysis tools. And the data sets are really huge. Uh, they're hoping to do, they haven't yet done it at quite this stage, they're already at the tens of terabyte scales, but they're hoping to do an analysis of about 200 seconds of shaking uh, on a simulation with the uh, frequencies all the way up to two hertz. Two hertz is a frequency that matters for people who build buildings. 
And so, the, in fact, the group at Carnegie Mellon is the civil engineering group interested in this. And I'll come back to this, but again, we're talking about hundreds of terabytes of data and statistical analysis techniques required. And in the building of this LSST telescope detector, uh, you have to do a lot of simulations uh, that require you to cut through cosmological simulations where you, you do time stepping in cosmological simulations, but then you want to take a look at something like lensing, which requires you to take a current point and move it backwards in time to see how the light progressed from that source to what we see today. And so you have to put together a lot of these time slices and the universe is uh, roughly uh, 30 terabytes of data at the scale at which people are doing those simulations now. So this is just to indicate that there's lots of large data projects that are of interest uh, to science. And there are various uh, resources available. There's, a, there's loosely coupled distributed resources. Uh, there are, of course, resources at individual campuses. There are farms, condor farms, for example, that are a particularly large one at Purdue where they have on the order of 7,000 uh, 7, uh, machines hooked together as a condor resource. The large investments that NSF has recently made, um, which were selected primarily not on the basis of whether they're good for large data analysis, but rather whether they're good for large floating point calculations. There's one at Texas, which is 579 teraflops in peak performance, 63,000 cores, and then more recently at the University of Tennessee, uh, the machine, which is pictured here, is actually at Oak Ridge. Um, almost 100,000 cores and a petaflop peak. I mentioned to you that uh, the increase in computing power is about a factor of 10 to the 6. When we started, we had a Cray XMP, cost $20 million here at Pittsburgh. Uh, its peak speed was under a gigaflop. So there's a factor of 10 to the 6 there that we've gotten in uh, 24 years of operation. Uh, and what's coming uh, in two years' time at Illinois is this machine called Blue Waters. It's an IBM machine, uh, which is essentially going to be 10 petaflops peak. And we don't have a lot of details about that machine, but that, that much about it is known. So what's missing? And what we found, based on discussions with many communities, is that we need a complementary architecture. Uh, I should go back and say these two machines, the Texas machine and the Tennessee machine, are by far the largest resources in the, uh, in the NSF program. And the way they're programmed is essentially by MPI. These are distributed memory machines with message passing as the traditional uh, programming paradigm. And what we think is required is a complementary architecture with very large shared memory. And as was also uh, mentioned several times in this meeting, you need to worry a lot when you have large data about I.O. You have to worry about it internally, just between your machine and your disk farm, and also how do you get the data. So you have to worry about um, uh, wide area networks as well. And, uh, we need to find ways of making more innovative use of wide area networks. Uh, the networking guys tell us that they can do all this, but somehow we haven't gotten around to uh, actually exploiting it very well. And large scale database systems. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about shared memory now because um, there's a great number of applications where shared memory would really be very useful as opposed to the large distributed memory machines that have been available. I'll give you some examples in a moment uh, from sort of traditional science, but there is a very large number of graph algorithms that really require it to you to do pretty random accesses uh, where the shared memory is very useful. And this is the area where the computer science community is much more interested than they have been in the past in these kinds of large machines. You can to do web analytics, to study security, machine translation, uh, marketing, uh, so on. 
We also, if you're going to do data-rich applications, the way in which you do data analysis is, is in some senses quite different from the way in which you do a large number of simulations. And that is, you don't know exactly how to look at the data, and you'd like to try quick and dirty methods for seeing if there are signals, if there are patterns that you can discover, and so on. So ease of programming is something which is really important. You would like to be able to throw together a program in half a day and try streaming a data set through it to see if there's any really good signal in there of something useful, as opposed to spending a month or three months writing a carefully crafted MPI program. And experience is that OpenMP, which is the shared memory computing paradigm that we use to exploit the parallelism, uh, it, people find it much more easy than, than MPI to use. So again, the shared memory uh, is important. And then a lot of the statistical algorithms that exist, again, favor large memory. So coming back to this seismological uh, example, in order to do this statistical analysis to see whether or not you're getting roughly the same predictions from uh, the, uh, the two different models or the two different ways of doing the seismic modeling, uh, you can't just take the same time slice and look at each, uh, each group's predictions because they could be off a little bit in their time evolution calculations. And so you have to look at a whole series of time slices at one time in order to see whether you can basically change the phase slightly and make these two groups align very well with each other. Um, and to do that, you need these substantial windows of time slices, which takes a lot of memory in order to do this. And similarly, as I mentioned in the LSST, in order to go back in time and look at the, uh, the lensing issue, you have to have uh, a large part of the simulation in memory that you can trace back to do these uh, lensing calculations. Uh, another interesting development uh, is computational epidemiology, which is an agent-based simula which are agent-based simulations these days. And um, typically they find again that the shared memory parallelism is, is what is needed in order to do this thing effectively. And the kinds of memories they're talking about is 70 to 80 gigabytes of shared memory. I mentioned this particular example uh, because this effort is actually supported by the Gates Foundation. There's a major grant to the University of Pittsburgh to the Graduate School of Public Health there to study epidemiological modeling. And the, super, our, our, the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center is involved uh, in that effort. So we realized this about large shared memory, and recently, about a year and a half ago, we bought a modest on the scale of uh, large NSF investments, a machine that had one and a half terabytes of coherent shared memory. And since its introduction, that machine has been very much in demand by the national community. And in addition to the traditional areas where people had been doing uh, work in the NSF program, we've seen work in new areas particularly of interest to computer scientists. And some of you who were next door at the previous session heard the kidney exchange talk by Thomas Sundholm, but he's also one of the experts. Uh, he's done uh, remarkable work in poker. And uh, Poker is uh, a different kind of AI problem because as opposed to typical games like chess or so on, you don't have complete information uh, about what's going on. And it's, and it's quite different and evidently the search space is, is much bigger and so on. I've mentioned epidemiological modeling. There are people doing social network analysis. There was a paper that I found revolutionary in science earlier this year by Tom Mitchell and the group on uh, cognition and functional magnetic resonance imaging that has used these resources and so on. So data, of course, has lots of different aspects. You can talk about the storage of it. 
You can talk about analysis techniques, you can talk about I.O. rates, you can talk about, as I've mentioned already, large memories. And then there are things like databases, curation, and so on. And all those things are of interest to the NSF. So let me mention some of their recent investments which are focused explicitly on data. So there was a competition for what was called a data intensive system and it was won by the San Diego Supercomputer Center. Interestingly, uh, just so you, you may think that they haven't quite gotten it yet, in the solicitation, the only requirement on the machine was that it have 200 teraflops of floating point power. It was supposed to be a data machine and nevertheless, they wrote in that the requirement was 200 teraflops. Uh, uh, the machine, I know its name, it's going to be called Flash Gordon, presumably because it has some flash memory in it. The details of that machine are not yet public. It doesn't, it's not up there yet, but the award has been made. And uh, it's likely to include software-based shared memory. There are two systems that are called data and visualization systems, but the emphasis has been primarily on data. I mean on visualization, I'm sorry. And one of them is at the University of Tennessee, uh, and their plan is to, again, these are systems that have been funded but don't yet exist. Um, their plan is to buy a system from SGI, 1024 processors, four terabytes of shared memory, uh, remind you, the machine we have is one and a half terabytes. But just to show you, uh, this is a machine with 10 teraflops of compute power, whereas the, the conditions on the data machine was that it have 200 teraflops of compute power. Um, and one of its great advantages is that it is co-located with the very large supercomputer that they have at Tennessee, so that you could simulate data Put, it up, put the data up on the file system, do the analysis on this other machine, and not worry about large-scale transferring of data. And similarly in Texas, they're putting up a system. It has a lot more uh, GPUs in it. Uh, it has, what, 256 times 2, 512 GPUs, whereas the uh, Tennessee machine only has 16 GPUs. But the machine in, in Texas is, again, distributed memory, uh, whereas the machine in, in Oak Ridge is, in Tennessee is, as I say, four terabytes of shared memory. Now, there's also the question of how you preserve data, how you store it and preserve it. And one of the uh, solicitations that NSF has put out is called DataNet. And the idea is to study sustainable digital data preservation and access, um, establishing models for the sustainability and so on. Uh, uh, the, these efforts are driven primarily by the library and information science people rather than by the computational people. And DataNet doesn't provide an actual archive of major data sets. I mean, the actual bits are not being stored in the DataNet project. I think it was from Tony that I heard the story of the Domesday book. Is that right? I must have heard it from you, where uh, this was a census taken after, uh, William after William the Conqueror, so a little after 1066. And in the middle 1970s or so, they, dis they decided, you know, this, this is a physical book with pages. And, and it is the census of England. They thought, well, you know, we better digitize this thing uh, so we can sustain it for posterity. And something like 20 years later, there was no reader for the medium on which they had the digitized version. So this question of data preservation and sustainability is a very serious question. On the, there's another issue, and that is that the way that NSF runs its supercomputing program, centers come and go. And data is located at centers. Uh, simulation data that is the result of lots of work that people have done. Uh, there is no policy and no sustained effort for data preservation. So if a center disappears, we don't know exactly what happens to the data. 
So there is an effort by the terror grid, which is sort of the, at the moment, the, uh, the set of large resources, high performance computing resources funded by NSF, uh, to have a systematic effort at archiving data at remote sites after you make primary copies. At, at Pittsburgh, we make two copies of the data for, for safety. Well, there's no reason why the second copy couldn't be someplace else, and we could host a lot of other people's second copies. This is something that we're thinking about, but it hasn't happened yet. Uh, NSF has also, of course, funded large collaborative projects built around data. So there's a very large one in plant science. Uh, there's a large one on ocean observatories. There's uh, earth scope and so on. So in various disciplines, uh, they have funded large collaborative efforts which are supporting people and sensors and so on uh, as opposed to large um, uh, uh, computer analytical resources. So really, uh, I, I know you guys have had a long time, so this talk is a little shorter than was, was scheduled. Uh, let me just summarize the points and I'll be glad to answer questions. There are many significant scientific drivers uh, for data intensive supercomputing. In our view, what, what's really needed now is large shared memory machines, uh, better visualization, that's probably gonna be eased by these two recent awards. Ease of programming, that's of course always there. IO, better use of uh, national networks. And of course, we desperately need better algorithms for data analysis, for detecting patterns and so on. NSF has recognized these needs and is beginning to make significant investments. I've told you what's already happened. Other things will be coming in the next few years. And of course, NSF also puts a lot of emphasis on training in every one of their, uh, in every one of their awards. So training in all of the associated technologies. So thank you very much. Yes. So, I mean, if your second copy of, of, of data, would you consider putting that in a commercial cloud or something like that? Or would that be a, a bar to keep the, the hell of a lot of data, I guess? It would, it would simply depend on what it costs, I think. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And we, we wouldn't, I mean, when I keep talking, when I'm talking about it is really not disk, but, but tape. But it's not uh, the tape Well. Maybe. I suspect maybe. Right. Just like we would have had to move to gallium arsenide. Remember that I one? <laughs> Uh, I don't think of it in those terms, but. <laughs> yes. Yeah.
involved in the debate in that proposal as a, as a partner that could actually have data? Not in any substantial way. Well, again, DataNet, I think, as I understand it, is just developing policies and, and, and studying techniques, but isn't going to actually host uh, uh, large collections. Now, uh, I think Mike is making a, a very good point, and that is, I mean, essentially, you would like, for, for data sets that are widely accessed, you would like to have them in various places around the country so that you could... Uh, uh, you could access them more quickly. And, and these, these large collaborative efforts that I mentioned, like iPlant or, or the Ocean Observatories and so on, again, those are communities that are developing their own policies and facilities for sharing the data or for access. Yeah. I was uh, interested in one of the bullet from the last slide uh, about training. Um, well, okay, you can mention your strong opinion, but I think it, go ahead. Right. But it's also true that, uh, you know, starting with PTAC and now with PCAS, which are the President's uh, Advisory Councils on Information Technology or Science and Technology, what have you, there is a perennial call for more emphasis on the software. And uh, I think that's true. And uh, I think that what may be happening at NSF in the next several years is a greater emphasis on the software. Any last questions? No? Yeah, yeah maybe as you're thinking about the as you're further thinking about this question of sort of dark data, right? Where you put data somewhere and then bring it to no one to use it. And I guess my, my thought about that is it's sort of self-fulfilling because where we where we tend to put 
No, I don't think that, well, I actually, I don't think that is the, that it, it is where it is generally because it was generated there is really the, I mean, for the super. Well, I think you're right. And so, for example, LSST plans to put all of its data in uh, in a database that, that you can access and so on. So that's certainly right. The, the, the other question I would say also is that for simulated data, uh, it may be cheaper to simply recompute it when you need it five years later, if you need it five years later, then keep it for five years. Yeah. Correct. Right. Um, any, any further questions? No. No. <laughs> Because it's a lot cheaper to keep the samples and rerun the experiment mm -hmm. than it is to save the data. So we're just not even going to try. Okay. In that case, the tape is dead. <laughs> <laughs>